Django is a great web framework for Python. It comes with an ORM, authentication, admin interface, and you know, it's got a huge ecosystem of plugins, but it also comes with a REPL, one that lets you interact with Django directly. But while it is functional, you are going to be stuck in the terminal, which means you're missing out, and you can really go a lot further with a modern Python notebook these days. That's why I'll be showing Marimo in this video and how you can set it up to make you more productive while working on Django projects. I'm going to show you a general setup that works with the Django ORM, but before getting there, let's start by showing some great SQL features first. Right, so let's start. I'm in a terminal over here, and you can see that I've got a small project. This mo demo over here is a Django project. There's a folder over here that contains the settings.py file. There's also the manage.py file together with a bunch of apps. But the thing I want to focus in on first is this SQL-like database. You could also use Postgres for what I'm about to show you, but I think it might be fun to use that database that's used in this Django project to show you what you can do with SQL. So let's go into that folder and I'm going to start up Marimo now and I'm going to be using UVX for that. I'm going to create a new notebook by saying Marimo edit. I'm giving it the sandbox flag to make sure everything is well contained in its own UV environment. And then in the notebooks folder, I'm just going to create demo.py. That is also a feature of Marimo, by the way. Marimo notebooks are stored as normal Python files under the hood, not as JSON files, which comes with a lot of benefits that we're going to see in a moment. But for now, this is the Python file. Let's start up the notebook. And there we are. This is a Marimo notebook. You can see that I've got some out of completion. I can also get new cells to appear down below. But if you're coming from Jupyter, one thing that might stand out as different is this sidebar over here. And in particular, we're going to zoom in on this database icon. When I click it, you can see a sidebar appear, and this is the place where you can add data sources to the notebook. So let's add one. You can see there's a bunch of databases supported, things like Postgres, MySQL, also SQLite. There's also DuckDB and a whole bunch of other ones. We're going to go with SQLite for now. And the file that I had locally was called db.sqlite3. So I'm just going to go ahead and add this connection. You can see that as a result, we now have a new cell that appeared. I can go ahead and run it. And the moment that I do, it's going to notice that some dependencies are missing. So again, let's just install those. And now that that's been dealt with, we can see that we have a database connection over here and we can explore it and we can see that there are all sorts of tables that we can access. I'm going to zoom in on this one table over here called comments. And when I hit this plus icon over here, I'm going to create a new cell that appears down below that's going to fetch me some data. Now, one thing to note right off the bat is that this is a SQL cell. That's right. Remo supports SQL directly, and that's useful for a whole bunch of analytical reasons. So let me just run this. It's going to install a couple of dependencies, and we're going to go ahead and hit play here. And we can see that we get a nice widget coming out for the table that I just queried. This is not a static representation of the table, by the way. You can see that we've got some pagination down below. We are also able to do some sorting if we wanted to. There's also some search options as well, if you want to maybe search through the entire uh, table down below over here. So maybe I'm looking for a specific name of a person and we can do some filtering. That's a lot of stuff to like. But the thing to observe at this point is that the table representation that you see here is an indication that we actually get a data frame back. So what Marimo does under the hood, you are able to actually uh, give an output variable to this statement over here. So when I run the cell now and refer to the variable down below, you can see that this data frame has the same contents. It's just that up here, we are writing SQL, and we can see that as a result, we get a data frame back inside of Python. So in this case, it's a Polar's data frame. So you can attach all sorts of plotting libraries like Altair. And that means that if you want to do SQL things for your analytics, you can actually do that very conveniently from a Marimo notebook. So we're able to add data frames. We can do things with it. But one extra bonus feature here, if we go back to the data sources panel, you're going to notice that this Python data frame also is listed here, right next to all the other tables we had in SQLite. The thing with data sources is that they are actually kind of special inside of Marimo. And to explain why, let me just hit this chat with AI tab over here. Let's uh, start a new chat. And one thing that I can do, calculate the average rating in the at DF. I can refer to a data frame that exists in memory. This is now a prompt that's going to be sent to the LLM and Marimo will automatically contextualize what you're pointing at. So in this case, if we're pointing to a data frame or a table, then we're going to add schema information to the prompt. And we're also going to add the first, I think, five rows, which is going to make it so much easier for the LLM to figure out what kind of query to write. And if, and if I now say run, it's going to detect that Anthropic needs to be installed in this case, because that's what I configured. Sure, I'm going to hit retry. But you're going to see that it starts thinking. And after a bit, it's going to produce me code that I need. This looks good. I can hit this button add to notebook. That's going to add a cell below. I should be able to run it and we can indeed see that we have some statistics. So things like average, median, min, max, count, etc. 
So that's neat, but let's go back and let's now say, could you make me a plot of the rate column instead? Uh, use Altair and make me a histogram. And once again, I can see that it generated some code. So again, I'm gonna add that to the notebook, close the side pane, let's run this. In this case, it wants to install Altair, that's great. And there we go, we have our histogram. At this point, I hope it's clear that if you have native SQL support in the notebook, especially when you combine it with coding agents, that it's really easy to go from idea to analysis. However, you can make it even better by using the interactive features of Marimo. And to highlight this, I made another Altair chart. On the x-axis over here, you have a date. On the y-axis over here, you've got a rating and you can see a distribution. But what I've now done is I've sort of decorated the Altair chart. You can see that I've got an Altair chart over here and then I'm wrapping it with this Marimo UI Altair chart function. And what that's gonna allow me to do is it's gonna allow me to actually make a selection inside of the chart. Now, I can take that time chart variable and I can ask for its value. And you can see that as I drag my selection around, that then the value updates which effectively just allows me to quickly filter the original data set. The data set that's used to generate this chart is something that I can now select over by using a interactive element. And that means that we're dealing with a reactive notebook and that deserves a little bit of an explanation before I move on to the next part. So how does that actually work? Well, in Marimo, I can have cells that contain variables. So let's do something like this, right? X is equal to one, Y is equal to two, X plus Y, well, that's three. So far, so good. But what you can now also see is that if I were to maybe update this cell, maybe set X equal to 10 and then run it, that then the cell at the bottom also updates automatically. I didn't have to rerun this cell manually. It was able to understand that it had to rerun. Internally, this is handled by the variable. So this cell knows that it needs X in order to run. And that means that this cell where X is declared is effectively a parent. And whenever this value updates, that also means that all the child cells have to update as well. This is the reactive nature of a Marimo notebook. And that makes it very easy for me to mix and match some UI elements. So I could do something like, hey, let's add a slider. Something like that, right? I've got a nice little slider over here. And I can now also say, hey, take the value of that slider. That now becomes X. And when I move around here, you can see that things automatically update. So now imagine that you don't just have the ability to mix and match SQL with custom Python code. You can also add UI elements and widgets in the mix too. And that means that for specific tasks, you can also create specific notebooks. And perhaps put differently, what I'm going towards here is that the Django admin interface is great, but there will always be things that the admin interface won't be able to tackle. And Marimo is very well suited to pick up on those things. However, if you want to go there, we are going to have to talk a little bit about the Django ORM. So in a Django app, normally, if you wanted to start up a shell, you would do something like Python manage.py, and then you would pass it the shell command like so. You'd get an interactive prompt and you could add a flag such as this runs in IPython or something like that. There is a reason why I would want to do this and not use a standard Python REPL. And that has everything to do with what Django expects in terms of where files are and what models are defined uh, for the ORM. And just to zoom in on that just a little bit, I've got this mode demo app and inside of that, I've got my trusty settings.py file. And if I were to scroll down, then you're going to see that there are all of these installed apps. If you want to access different models that you've defined in your app, then they do have to be added to this installed apps list. And it's things like this that the manage.py shell command actually sets up for you. If we're going to be using Marimo, we can definitely still do all of that. It's just that we're going to have to introduce a helper function to make sure that things like this are taken care of. And that brings me to this notebook over here that has this setup Django helper function. If you check the show notes, there's a link by the way. And this is the function that's going to take care of everything that we need. You're able to give a project name as well as a project path. You can also see that we are setting the settings module and effectively it just deals with a whole lot of boilerplate. However, if you run this one function, you are able to import your models as you would normally inside of a Django shell. However, if you wanna use this model now, we do have to take a little bit of a step back and understand the asynchronous nature of a Marimo notebook. And this is all because of the asynchronous nature of working in cells. Once a cell is done running, then we can trigger the next one. And unfortunately, that does mean that we are going against a assumption that the Django shell has. When you're interacting with models in the Django shell, you can pretty much assume that everything is running synchronously. And if you really wanna mimic the same behavior inside of a notebook, then it could make sense to run this one flag over here, the Django allow async unsafe flag. And for local development, that is totally going to work just fine. As you can see, I can go down below over here. I can select this dog breed model that I've got. I can uh, query for the objects. I can call all and I get this query set back. However, 
if I were now to say, hey, allow unsafe equals false, and if I were to restart this notebook, then we get this Django exception that says that you cannot call this from an asynchronous context. You either have to use a thread or you have to use the sync to async functionality. And if you're doing anything with the production database, this is the safer option. So for example, let's say that I'm going to create a new dog breed. So that'll be a poodle and the description is going to be that it's just very cute, right? This is a call that wouldn't run, again, because of the asynchronous nature. So when I run it, I get the same message. But there is this sync to async function that I can go ahead and use, and I've renamed it to DB, such that I could write code that looks a little bit like this. This effectively will wrap the original function into something that the notebook can handle. And if I were to pass the arguments that I had before, then this would run just fine. And again, just for context, if this was what you had beforehand, right, then to run everything safely in a notebook, what you can do is wrap it like so, and now it will go ahead and run, and you can just await this. And there you go, we can create dog breed objects. And this particular model is set up that I can run this uh, multiple times. Now, of course, it does feel a little bit formal to wrap your normal Django code with this extra function. But the benefit is that you are in the end able to write these notebooks that you can reuse elsewhere. And you can also choose to run this with the allow unsafe flag turned on, but this does come with some risks. So for my personal work, I tend to do this pattern over here. But the main benefit is that at this point in time, I can write my notebook such that I'm able to communicate and also update things that are in my database. And the really convenient thing about notebooks is that I can quite easily add machine learning code, do all sorts of analytics. And again, because I'm also able to add user interface elements, you can also come up with very custom admin interfaces for some work that you might not be able to do inside of the normal Django admin framework. And again, this setup Django function, check the show notes, you'll find a link. But before wrapping up this video, I wanna show off this one extra feature, this one extra thing that you can do to make working with the ORM just a little bit nicer inside of a notebook. So again, just to go over some code, I have a poodle over here that is a dog breed that's from the Django ORM. I can choose to save that poodle and that way the poodle also has an ID, right? And you can have a look at the representation of the poodle. This is a method that you would typically implement because if you're using the Django shell, you do get a bespoke output over here. However, we are in a notebook environment now, in the browser, and that means that we can give ourselves a little bit more freedom. A Marimo notebook allows you to attach a display method onto an object, and this will let you define anything that you can render with HTML, and this then becomes the representation of the object that you get out. So again, we can see Poodle, we can again see the cute description, but we can also attach a photo if we like. And if a display method is attached, then this will also be the representation of the object in general. And in Marimo, that now also means that every time that you're talking to the ORM and you're gonna get the object back, that you can add a custom representation for it as well. And also another thing that's kind of fun is you can of course also make a list and then Marimo will also respect the display method here. So you can actually see that we render a list with very pretty elements inside of it. And just to show you the implementation as well, you can see over here that I've got this dog breed class that's just the Django model over here and you can see that I've attached this display method and I'm using a helper library called mo html that allows me to add paragraph tags diff tags and image tags and uh, these are all things that you can customize using some of the properties of the object itself but again the reason that I'm emphasizing this is because you can really make a bespoke environment for your specific use case. And the final thing that I really shouldn't forget to mention if we have a look at what the file looks like the Marimo notebook itself it is just a python file and you can see that we are using UV. So all the dependencies that this notebook is using, all the stuff that we installed live while editing the notebook, uh, that is now added as a dependency with a version number attached. You can also see that we specify the Python version and this makes the notebook nice and self-contained. You can run this as a normal Python script if you wanted to, or you can use Marimo together with a sandbox environment to make sure that whenever you edit this notebook are in a separate environment that's maintained by UV. And if you're curious, you can scroll down. You can see that we have all these different cells. They're just Python functions that are decorated. There are many benefits to saving this as a Python file, not the least of which is the fact that you can also easily add this to Git. So the pattern that I really like to follow when I'm building a Django web app is that I do end up with a notebooks folder. Inside of that, there's a bunch of scripts that sometimes represent a little bespoke interactive UI thing that can't really easily be done inside of the Django admin, or it's a notebook that does an analysis, or it's a notebook that I tend to run as a script quite frequently. I have SQL at my disposal, but I also have Python at my disposal. So if I need to add some machine learning code, that is very easy to do, especially because I've got access to both SQL and the ORM right from the notebook. If you are curious to learn more, 
feel free to like and subscribe. We have lots of videos about Marimo, about all the details and all the different features that we have. So feel free to follow. And once again, if you check the show notes, you will find a link to this notebook if you want to try this yourself on your own machine. Thanks for listening.